We are continuing our series, Wisdom for COVID-19 Living, based on the advice of psychologist Margie Donlin in her Mental Health Survival Tips for Quarantine. The advice for today is that in times of stress or struggle, reach out to others. Don't go it alone is the title for today's message, and it's based on Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. And let's read these words at this time. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And may the Lord bless to us the reading of these words. Before I begin, I'd like to invite our joke meister to share a joke with us. Take it away, Nathan. Hey, Maranatha, it's Nathan here with another joke for you. I've been reading a book about anti-gravity. It's impossible to put down. <laughs> Bye. Oh, that was a groaner, Nathan. I hope no one puts you down for that one. But I do want to talk about this idea of not being able to put something down. Because there's something I can't put down. It is a picture or an idea that I find in the stories of Jesus that inspires me and challenges me. And it's this. It's the idea of a Jesus-like grace community. And I'll talk more about what this looks like. But in this chapter, we see Jesus referring to the community working together to deal with a challenge. And we're going to see how this kind of community is the community where Jesus works powerfully. So we'll ask and consider two questions. The first question is this, what kind of community is Jesus talking about? And secondly, how can I experience this kind of community? The first question, what kind of community is Jesus talking about? Our text is verse 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. I'm sure you've heard that verse before. It's often used to encourage us that we are not alone when we gather together. But I want to qualify this verse. It does not apply to any or every group that meets supposedly in the name of Jesus. I was listening to a group, a prayer by a, an imperial wizard for the Ku Klux Klan gathering to make their plans for civil unrest during the civil rights movement, 1964. And Sam Bowers, the imperial wizard, prays, bless us in our endeavors in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, he was praying in the name of Jesus. They were gathered in the name of Jesus, but what they were doing was not Jesus's kind of work. So what really is this community that Jesus says he is present in and works in? I believe the answer is found in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus literally means the Lord saves. It can be expanded to mean the Lord heals, the Lord helps, the Lord delivers, but it, you get the point. It's the Lord stepping in to benefit, to bless, to help, to grace those in need. That's the spirit of this community that Jesus is talking about. Any community which, is, which joins me in my desire to save, to serve, to bless, to help, to heal, is my kind of community. That's what Jesus is saying. We see this further in the whole chapter. If you read the whole chapter, you'll see that it has seems to have a theme. Uh, Bible scholars tell us that this is the fourth teaching of Jesus. There are five teaching sections in the book of Matthew, and this is the fourth one. And it speaks to community relations. And I'll just walk through it quickly. It starts with raising up a lowly child. In the Jesus community, the lowly ones are lifted up, not put down. Uh, it goes on to talk about, in verses 
six through nine, not causing the little ones to stumble, but in a Jesus community, you protect the little ones and you work on the own, your own sins, which are causing others to hurt or stumble. Um, then it goes on in verses 10 to 14 about looking for that lost sheep, being so committed to look for that one that has gone astray. Then in the section that we read, that we just read, we have, what do you do when someone has sinned against you? And this is why I don't think this is about uh, discipline, how you got to deal with someone who refuses to repent, but rather how you restore someone. That's what's going on here, how you save someone. And the steps that are follow followed are an increasing uh, attempt to grace the people. You go first yourself. If you can't do it yourself, you go with two or three others, then you go to the church. And then in the end, if they don't repent, you don't excommunicate them. Uh, that's, that's how we often read this. But no, you treat them as pagans and tax collectors. Isn't that excommunication? Well, no, it's not. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? Right. He went out of his way to reach out to them. He sat down with them at the table. He called them to follow him. This particular book, Matthew, is written by Matthew, the tax collector. He was graced beyond belief. That's what this is talking about. How do we increasingly grace people to draw them back and restore them? That's what it means to bind and to loose. It is not to, to establish who's in the church and who's out, but rather you bind the wounds of those who are, are wounded and you loose those who are in chains. You set them free. That's what we're agreeing about in Jesus' name when we come together. How can we help people? How can we grace people? The chapter ends with a section on forgiveness. How many times should I forgive my brother? Not just seven times, but 70 times seven. And then Jesus gives the story of a servant who has forgiven a great debt and then refuses to forgive someone else. And Jesus is basically saying, look, grace other people as you have been graced. That's what's going on in this chapter. And this is the idea that I can't put down. It's the idea that, that captures me and energizes me when I think about Jesus and the Jesus community. We see a beautiful picture of this in Matthew chapter 10, and I want to read that to you. Verses 2 to 4. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, how could Jesus bring together such a, such a diverse group of sinners and make them one, one team, one community. You've got Peter, who's never in doubt of himself and doubting Thomas. You've got Matthew, who works for the Romans, and Simon, the zealot, who kills people who work for the Romans. How do you bring together such a diverse group of sinners when they all recognize their desperate need for Jesus? This is how Jesus brings together Pharisees and prostitutes, tax collectors and Torah teachers, sinners of all kinds. And I wonder, are we this kind of church? Are we the kind of place, a safe place for sinners to come as they are so that Jesus can meet them and help them become who he calls and saves them to be? This kind of community is seems like a dream. It goes against the gravity of human relations, but it is exactly what Jesus came to do, and it is exactly what Jesus calls us to do as well, to be a Jesus-like grace community. Jesus says, I will be with you when you join together in this. In other words, not just I'll be there, but I will be active. I will back you in what you're doing. That's what verses 18 and 19 are saying. Heaven will back you up. The Father will support you. Things will happen when you come together in this gracious way. Not condemning each other, not disciplining each other, but gracing each other so that we can safely deal with our sins. That's what a grace community is about. Not denying sin, but dealing with them with Jesus, our gracious Savior. This is the kind of community that Jesus is talking about. And this is the kind of community we need in times like these. The second question, how can I experience this kind of community? 
I don't know about you, but I long for this kind of community. A place where I can come to be just as I am, but not to stay just as I am. A community where I can be honest without having to feel condemned or criticized or judged by others who themselves have their own issues to deal with. Rather, a place where I can be real and know that others are doing the same, and together we can talk to Jesus and hear from him how he wants us to grow and be more like him. In these times of stress and struggle during COVID-19, we're all going through different kinds of feelings and fears, uh, emotions that are getting the best of us. We're, we're experiencing grief. We're lonely. Our faith is not as strong, we're discovering, as we had hoped it would be. We are maybe doing things, responding in ways that are not holy or healthy. But who do we talk to about this? How do you be honest with others? It's, it's kind of humbling and shaming to be say, I'm, I'm falling apart. I'm, I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing. Uh, fear is getting the best of me. Do you have people that you can talk to like this? If you do, praise God. But I know that many people don't dare. Well, Jesus wants the church to be this kind of community. And I think it's it's very appropriate that he encourages us to focus on the two or three, especially in this time when we can't meet as church as a whole. And even if we could, how do you share personally with 300 people? It's just too big. What's more, there are people in this church I don't know well, and I don't really trust as much. So two or three gives us a number that we can work with. This two or three idea comes from Deuteronomy chapter 19, where it also is dealing with a situation of um, accusation, one person accusing another person. And the advice is given, bring in witnesses. Don't do this on your own. Don't go it alone. You need witnesses not only to support you. These are not just cronies who agree with you and will say whatever you want them to say. In fact, Deuteronomy 19 says these aren't witnesses need to be truthful. They need to tell you the truth. They need to be people who can be a second set of ears and eyes and who can hold you accountable in addition to supporting you. I think we all need two or three people, someone else at least, that we can share our heart honestly with and be real with, who can speak truthfully to us in a gracious way so that we see our lives from someone else's perspective as well. This is not about condemnation. This is not about giving or receiving advice. It's simply that second set of eyes and ears, that other sinner who comes alongside to support me and hold me accountable. I've long encouraged these kinds of relationships. I've had several of them myself. I was speaking to one person and uh, I said to him, you know, my, my real hope is to see this spread in the church so that you would not just continue to meet with me. I love meeting with you and talking with you, but that you could find someone else that you could share with so that I can do this with someone else. And he said to me, you know, I can share with you but I can't share with anyone else in the church. You're the pastor. I can share with you. Well, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that he can share with me and he trusts me, but I can't do this for 300 people. And it's not sustainable. And it's also a sad commentary on a church when in a church of 300 people, there's no one we can trust. We need to consider this very carefully. What kind of community are we? We need this kind of support. And so I, my encouragement to you is to think of one or two people that you can call up, even if you can't see them in person, call them up and say, would you be okay if we would just chat once a week, once every two weeks, and I can just let you know where I'm at. I'm not looking for advice. I'm not looking for you to tell me what to do. I just, I just need to be able to share. And if you want, I'd, I'd like for you to share with me too, if you want, but if not, that's fine. That's the other thing. Don't just ask for someone to support you, but think about someone that you could be a support to. Don't, don't go to them and say, I want to be your supporter, but give them a call and say, how are you doing? Become that gracious, trusting friend that someone else will need. Some of you already have people like this, and that's great, but there are others in the church that don't. And as a grace community, we need to pay attention to them as well. 
So the advice of Jesus, as I hear it, is don't go it alone. Look for a few other people that you can trust, that you can uh, listen to for truth and uh, gain from them a, a perspective on yourself so that you can learn and grow. Wouldn't it be great if we all had people like this? The sad case is that many churches are not safe places. Many churches are not grace places. I've talked to too many people who've left the church because they've been hurt by the church. Now, on the one hand, that shouldn't surprise us. We are a diverse group of sinners, and so we can't be trusted by everyone. We're all going to do things at times that hurt others. And so to those who have been hurt, I'm sorry, but it's, it's unavoidable. On the other hand, it should also convict us as a church to say, what do we got to do to become more of a gracious community, a community that apologizes for our failures, admits our imperfections, and works on them? Well, it's not about changing the church. It's about changing me. The focus of Jesus in verses 5 through 9 is working on your own stumbling issues. When he talks about taking the log out of your own eye, he, he means that. Don't just focus on the sins of others as if that's all that matters. What you really need to consider is your own behavior. Whether you're a, a, a sexual sinner or a religious sinner, a Pharisee or a prostitute, doesn't matter. We all have sins we have to deal with. We need a safe place to deal with what's going on inside of us so that the devil doesn't get a foothold so that our wounds can be healed, so that our bonds can be loosed, so that we can become the grace community that Jesus saved us to be, so that others can experience this as well. How can I experience this kind of community? Start with yourself and start with a few other people that you can trust and be gracious, gracious to them and gracious to yourself as you learn and grow with Jesus. How can I experience this kind of community? Well, maybe start by praying about it. There's so much more that I could say, and there's probably some things that I haven't said well enough. I've probably provoked some of you to think, and I've probably provoked some of you to anger. I don't know. Um, I'm sure I've raised lots of questions and even some concerns. I don't know what this fully looks like. I just know how Jesus treated people. I know how Jesus treated pagans and tax collectors. I know the, the gracious experience that sinners found around him, that they could be real and honest just as they were, so that he could transform them into who he saved them to be. That's the kind of community I'm, I'm eager for the idea that I can't put down and that I want us to become even more now in this COVID-19 time. I know some of us are struggling and yet how many of us are reaching out to others? Don't go it alone. Final word, don't be hard on those who've left the church. Many of them have been seriously and sincerely hurt. And those who have been hurt and left the church, don't be too hard on the church. The church is a mixed, diverse group of sinners. We need each other, and it's not going to be perfect. But if we all come with a, a humble heart, willing to try, appreciating the grace of Jesus as he's shown it to us and extending it to others, I think we can more and more become a Jesus-like grace community. Do you want this? I do. Then let's pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and that I need you to save me from the penalty and power of my sin. Help me to appreciate your amazing grace for me and help me to show your amazing grace to others. Help us to become a Jesus-like grace community. Amen.